Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this service of, of Holy Communion. Uh, there won't be a collection taken during the service. There is a basket at the back if you want to give to, give to the work of the church. Uh, communion, I'll, I'll come around to you with communion, so all you need to do is lift your mask and pop the bread in. It'll be bread alone uh, during the, for the communion. Uh, everything else should be quite straightforward, I think, as we go along, hopefully. So let me pray for us as we begin. Loving Father God, we just thank you that we can gather together as your people here today. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us in so many ways. As we think of your love that knows no limits, to give your one and only Son, your beloved Son, so that we could be a forgiven people. Lord, we, we find that hard to grasp. And so, Lord, we want to praise you, we want to worship you, we want to know you better, and we want to be the people that you would have us be. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's begin with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now we come to our time of confession, so let's just take a moment or two of quiet and think of those things we need to confess to the Lord. And we'll say these words together. Let's say together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ promises to pardon and forgive all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. May God grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit so that forgiven and cleansed from our sins, our lives may be holy, shielded by God's power until Christ comes. Amen. And now Stuart's going to come and lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Corrie Ten Boom said, we never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that he will get us involved in his plan for the answer. If we are true intercessors, we must be ready to take part in God's work on behalf of the people for whom we pray. So with these words in mind, let us come before our loving Father God in prayer now. Lord, in our changing and uncertain world, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your steadfast love never changes. And we want first of all to say thank you, Lord, for all the blessings we've received. For the love of our families and friends. For the rest of the night and the promise of the day ahead. For the provision of food and drink that we take for, uh, for granted so often. For the things that make our lives more comfortable, for health and vitality, for the things that we enjoy, leisure activities and hobbies, especially in these days of lockdown. We give for you our grateful thanks, Lord. Amen. And in these times of uncertainty, we pray for those who find these times a struggle for those who face uncertainty with their jobs, for those who face redundancy or reduced hours, for those who are stretched financially because of the lockdown, for those whose lives are difficult to manage 
because of childcare or other family commitments. Lord God, we pray that you'll bring relief to the, all these who are struggling with life's hardships and trials. Grant them patience and forbearance. And we remember the words of the psalmist, Psalm 9, verse 12. God does not ignore the cries of the afflicted. And we pray for young people who face uncertainty due to the exam problems, those who did not get the grades that they anticipated, those whose results have been delayed, for those facing and finding alternative university places, those who have to reset their exams, or those who have to look for jobs. Lord, give them grace. Give them determination to work out their future hand, their plans, but and to put their hands into your hand. Guide each one and bless their endeavours. In the name of him who loves us. Amen. For those who face uncertainty due to sickness or ill health, we ask for your grace to be upon them and that they may know your healing today. And we remember especially before you, Jack Sharp, and any known to us personally. Lord, grant them healing. By your Holy Spirit, touch them now, we pray. Amen. For those who face uncertainty due to bereavement, we pray, Lord, for any that we know. Lord Jesus, who wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus, come alongside those who mourn. Be their rock and fortress, and uphold them, we pray. And may they know your loving kindness in the days ahead. And we remember our missionary partners before you in the work they're committed to. Gemma and Andrew working with Wycliffe Bible Translators and for Mark and Helen at CMS. Again, as their work is affected by the coronavirus, Lord, we ask you to bless them, even in these times of trials. We thank you for their commitment and dedication in spreading the gospel across the world. Thank you for their hearts that are leaning towards you in that respect. Bless them, we pray. Amen. And we pray for researchers and medical workers that are searching for a COVID vaccine. COVID vaccine. And we pray too for those that may be suffering from COVID or recovering. May they know that you are our loving Heavenly Father, that you are faithful and unchanging. Help those who are working, Lord, to discover a, a cure and a vaccine for the, this cruel disease, Lord. Uh, we pray that it will be brought about speedily, that many will be healed from that disease, Lord. Amen. And finally, for ourselves, Lord, help each one of us to turn to you and to know you as our rock and our fortress in these uncertain times. As we listen to your holy word today, may we incline our hearts towards you. May we hear and understand and follow you in all our ways, through all our days. Amen. Loving Father God, you are so faithful. And Lord, we thank you that we can trust you completely. Lord, we thank you that you never let us down. You never fail on a promise. And Lord, help us to trust you more and more. And Lord, now as we're about to hear from your word, Lord, help us to be those who don't just hear it, but apply it to our lives, to the glory of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So as now going to come and read our passage for today.
The reading today is taken from Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 to 33. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Sheshem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country to Seir to Esau. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared the fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. 
Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of a hundred and ten. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance, at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks so much, Zoe. That was really well read and a long reading, weren't it? So it's great. Thank you very much. Well, choices, choices, choices. Or decisions, decisions, decisions. I mean, we have to choose everything, don't we, these days? You know, like what TV channel we're going to watch or what mobile phone provider. That can be a bit of a dodgy one. Or just what foods we eat, we choose, our attitudes, our friends, and, and how we're going to live our lives. Choices are a necessary part of life. And people who have difficulty with choices will have difficulty with life itself. I mean, just think about it. If you don't make choices about where you'll invest your time, you'll, you'll be constantly running around and you'll feel torn in different directions. You'll be overwhelmed and you'll be simply achieving nothing at all. And if you don't choose what you're passionate about in your life, you'll tend to stand for nothing and fall for anything. And if you don't choose to be financially responsible, you'll always feel poor and never know financial freedom. If you don't choose to make good decisions about your health, you'll probably be prone to illness and you'll never feel energized and alive. Choices are important. And some choices are made by default. I mean, when we refuse to make a choice, we have in essence made the choice but well, the best choices are the ones that we make consciously and deliberately. In the final chapter of the book of Joshua, we find Joshua at the end of his life. Chapter 24 records Joshua's final words to the people of Israel. This faithful servant of God took the people on a stroll down memory lane as he reminded them of all the things God had done for his people Israel. Then Joshua challenged the people to be faithful in response to God's mercy and grace. He wanted to make a deliberate, conscious, and resolute choice to be faithful to the Lord of the universe. This passage is filled with lots of practical application. If we think about what Joshua was challenging the people of Israel and us to do, then I think we can learn several things. We all serve someone or something. I think we like to think of ourselves as people who are very independent, people who are free to do what we want. I mean, we are British. 
which means we don't serve anyone, do we? But in truth, well, many of us find ourselves serving someone. And, and we're driven by something outside of ourselves. Many of us have to do work, don't we, for someone, which means we are, in essence, serving them. Many businesses are service-based industries, which means the job is to please and serve clients. The idea that we don't serve anyone, really, is a bit of a myth. Yet Joshua recognized that everyone serves someone. He said to the Israelites, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Notice that Joshua didn't give serve no one as one of his options. The people were told that there were many gods they could serve and they should choose who it was that they were going to serve. Who was going to be their god and who are they going to serve? And of course, there's many different religions that clamor for our loyalty, aren't there? We look around us, there's all sorts of different religions and there seem to be new ones coming up every day. <coughs> But in addition to these fairs, there's other taskmasters, isn't there? I mean, what about the gods of success? We work, don't we, to be successful, whatever it is that's our goal. Then there's the gods of materialism. We're enslaved to getting stuff. We live to buy more and more things or the latest gadgets. Probably things that we'll consume or throw away or sell at a car boot sale, not long after but we buy these things what about the gods of academia i mean we serve the latest fads studies or theories we work hard to be at the cutting edge of academia or the gods of public approval good old peer pressure we want other people to like us don't we and these followers do what they have to do. Some will even sell their soul to the devil in order to gain the approval of other people. Some children just live for the approval of the parents. In exam week, that's one of those weeks where that's put to the test, isn't it? On the other hand, many parents these days seem to live to gain the approval of their children and give them pretty much anything they ask for. Then there's things like our dress, our spending, our language, our friends. They're all chosen to get the right kind of approval that we crave. And when all this is said and done, our ultimate service either is to the world or to the Lord, to God or to Satan. It's good to take some time to just think, just challenge ourselves and ask that honest question. Who or what are or am I serving? What is it that occupies our greatest attention? What causes us to become the most animated and passionate in our conversations? The answer to those questions may point us in the direction of the gods that are calling most forcefully for our allegiance. But then why, why should we choose to serve the Lord? The word that's used for serving Joshua 24 has the obvious sense of being devoted to. Joshua qualifies this service with the words insincerity and in faithfulness. Joshua is calling people to something greater than half-hearted devotion that characterizes many people today. He calls us to a service of the Lord that involves giving God all authority and ownership over our lives. He's calling for people to stop playing about and become serious about their discipleship. If you were going for some kind of surgery, the doctor or hospital, they'd make sure that you were told all about the known risks in that surgery that you're about to have, wouldn't they? You'd be told the worst case scenario, what could happen if things go badly, or the best case scenario, what the doctor hopes is going to happen. And you might be told that a certain procedure is going to have you in hospital for a week or so, 
then after the pain's gone, you'll be, you'll be great. Or you could be told that a surgery will correct one problem, but could create another one. But before you make a choice on whether to have this surgery or not, the hospital wants to make sure that you are, the decision you're making is with informed consent. Joshua wanted the people of Israel to commit to the Lord with informed consent. He reminded the people of their history. In the first 13 verses, notice how many times God drew attention to what he had done for his people. God had made them, first of all, into a nation. He fought their battles. He was the one who brought them out of slavery. He chose them, not the other way around. There's a great summary in verses 12 to 13 where he says, I sent the Oinites ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. I gave you a land in which you did not toil and cities that you did not build. And you live in them. You eat from the vineyards and olive groves that you didn't plant. The people affirm Joshua's assessment. They agree that in verses 17 and 18, it was the Lord our God himself who brought us out, who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. The Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. The people seem willing to serve the Lord, but then Joshua says in verse 19, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is an holy God. He's a jealous God, and he'll not forgive your rebellion and your sins. Is Joshua speaking in some kind of riddles here? Well, no, I believe Joshua's saying that we're so dependent on the Lord that we can't even serve him without his help. Our dependence on him is so great that we can't even serve him without his help. Joshua argues when, when you look at what God has done, when you consider God's work on our behalf, we should be willing to follow him. We should choose him with informed consent. But then the big question is, what does it mean for us to choose to serve the Lord? Well, let's use marriage as an example. What would you say if someone asked you, what does it mean to choose someone as a spouse? Would you say it means giving somebody a, a fancy ring? Would you say it means going through some fancy ceremony? Would you say it means sharing intimacy in a, a, and living in the same home? Each of these answers, they'd be inadequate, wouldn't they? Each of these things may be part of the process, but it's not really what choosing a spouse involves. Choosing someone as a spouse is a commitment to give yourself to the other person completely. It's a desire to be attentive to what that person needs, sometimes. Denise is in here, she'll tell you the truth. It's a, it's a declaration that you'll stand with that person through good times and bad times. The changes and the surprises, the advancement of years. It's to commit yourself to one another in a way different from every other relationship of your life. And it's the same way with the commitment to the Lord. It's more than just joining a church or performing religious rites or saying magic words. Choosing to follow Christ is a commitment. Choosing to serve the Lord means at least five things. First, it means we must be willing to quit straddling the fence. Fence sitting is an English art form, isn't it? We're great at sitting on the fence. Politicians get elected by learning how to sound like a person of conviction while telling everyone what they want to hear. 
We're masters of finding ways to hold on to the idols of the world while we claim to follow the Lord. We declare that we want to follow the Lord, but we still want all the stuff the world offers us. The power, the indulgence, the freedom to choose which commands of God will obey and which will not obey. And it's just not acceptable. And it's just as unacceptable to the Lord as a spouse who, who has a mistress on the side. God wants an exclusive relationship. Second, we must be willing to root out everything that hinders our commitment. Joshua told the Israelites that they must get rid of their idols, and we must do the same. If we're going to truly become a follower of Christ, we must be honest about our sin. We must refuse to make excuses and do real battle with our sinful tendencies. It means we must eliminate things in our lives that, that draw us away from God, no matter how painful these things might be. It might mean weaning ourselves from our sports obsession, limiting time on the internet, changing our TV viewing habits, staying away from pubs, limiting our contact with people who bring out the worst in us, dealing with our angry outbursts. It might mean getting rid of our credit cards, changing our attitude or working hard to change our vocabulary. If we're serious about our commitment, we'll do what's necessary to honor and obey the Lord in our lives. Then thirdly, we must seek to influence the world rather than the world influencing us. Those who follow Christ must be willing to stand up and confront sinful behavior. We must resist worldly thinking. We must resist a political correctness that demands that we, we lower our standards of holiness. Our job is to show the love of God, even in a hate-filled society. We are to bring kingdom values into a pagan society. And we have to live true to the gospel, even if it means us being unpopular with those around us. Fourthly, we must pursue our discipleship as a serious commitment. Joshua warned the people that if they profess faith, yet continue to play with the idols of the world, they would face God's judgment. Our Lord reserves some of his fiercest comments for the hypocrites or the pretenders. Remember in Matthew 23 how Jesus pronounced the wars on those who made great boasts about the allegiance to the Lord, but didn't follow through. He firmly, uh, firmly condemned their hypocrisy. Somewhere along the line, good intentions and pious words must translate into action. I remember those words from the book of Revelation where the Lord told the church of Laodicea that they were lukewarm in their commitment. And as a result, he was going to spit them out of his mouth. In other words, they made him sick. The Lord told the church that he preferred that they're either hot or cold. If they were hot or fervent in faith, then they'd have the kind of devotion that God desired. But if they were cold, at least no one would be confused where they stood. It'd be obvious that they didn't follow the Lord. But lukewarm people, like so many, they're deadly because they talk like believers, but they live like the world around them. They misrepresent what real commitment to Christ involves and compromise the gospel. And then finally, we must be willing to make a lifetime commitment. I'm sure we've all met people who've gone through a, a discipleship fad. They were religious for a while. They were, they were really enthusiastic. They were at every meeting. They were outspoken. They were all of a sudden, they seemed to lose interest. They moved on to the next fad. Perhaps they obsessed about exercise or eating healthy or, or cleaning up the environment or saving wells. The discipleship was just one of a list of different fads. And it wasn't real commitment. The kind of discipleship God desires 
is one that's total. Jesus warned us that no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God in Luke 9. Make no mistake, if you truly decide to follow Jesus, then there's no turning back. It means you're truly going to bet your life on him. It means you'll stand or fall with him. A person who enlists for the military makes a commitment, don't they? They give themselves to the service for a period of time. It might be five years, ten years. They sign up for so long. And during that time, they endure the training, don't they, first of all, which is pretty intense. And then they go where they're sent to. And they do what they're told to do. But once that commitment's made, you don't pick and choose where you're going, what you're going to do. You live under a new authority. The only difference for a child of God is that our enlistment is indefinite. We're in his service for life or forever. We're choosing to submit to God's authority. We're agreeing to train hard and do what God commands us to do. We serve him and he doesn't serve us. Renowned evangelist D.L. Moody was transformed by a preacher who said, the world has yet to see what God can do through one person who is completely committed to him. Moody set out to be that one person who was committed and God used him gratefully, uh, greatly. But what would happen if you were that one person who was totally committed to the Lord? What could God do in and through you or me? Joshua's question is one that we have to address. Who will you serve? We take a stand for Christ or we continue to sit on the fence? Will you go all in with the Lord or will you continue to just play at faith? I believe it's a true statement. We're as close to God as we want to be. I urge, you, I urge you to make a decision today. Choose to have a close relationship with God. Be intentional about, about who you're going to follow in your life. Don't play games. And choose to seriously follow the one who has given his life for you. For some of you, choosing Christ will mean entering into a new relationship with God through Jesus. For you, it may be time to say to the Lord, yes, I do believe that Jesus died on the cross as a sufficient payment for my rebellion. I do believe that his resurrection proves that Jesus was who he said he was, and I'm willing to put my confidence for eternity into Christ. Give up on all hope of being good enough to earn heaven on my own. But instead I take the right standing with God that is offered through Jesus Christ. I receive the gift of eternal life and I welcome the transformation of your spirit. Take this opportunity to receive the new life that God offers in Christ. Start that journey right now. Others of you have said such words. You concluded that Jesus is the only way to forgiveness and eternal life. However, we need to choose to become serious about our commitment to Christ. We need to resolve to stop playing at faith and start getting serious. We need to move beyond an almost Christian and start following him fully. Coaches tell the players, don't they, in various sports all the time that they need to give 100%. Some say 110, I don't know how they work that one out. But they want the players to practice regularly, diligently. They want them to learn the tactics, the moves, practice the basics and do the work that needs to be done on and off the field in preparation for the game. The athletes that it's not serious may keep up for a while, but eventually they'll be surpassed by those who work seriously. The Lord wants us to make a serious effort in our commitment to him. Are we ready to get serious 
in following Christ? Will we take a hard look at our lives and root out all those things that stand between us and serious discipleship? We need to stop making excuses, confront the things that are dragging us down, abandon those reasons we give for not doing what's right. We need to get off the couch and get into the game. Will you make time to build your relationship with him? Will you give priority time to worship, Bible study, prayer, and seeking God's will for your life? Make an appointment with God right now. Write it in your calendar or your diary. Be as serious about this daily and weekly appointment as you are other appointments in your calendar. Resolve to be a good steward of what God's given you. Stop looking at what you have as yours to use as, as you want. Instead, start seeing it as what you have as is, to be used as he sees fit. Let him control your diary, your checkbook, your free time. Dare to reach out to hurting people. Look past the person's appearance or history and see the person in need of God's grace. Determine that you'll be willing to be inconvenienced to reach out to someone else. In Jesus' name. Dare to step beyond what's comfortable. To risk doing what is right. Stop making everything about us. Even though we make it sound quite spiritual. And start focusing our lives on the Lord. Joshua tells us it's time to make a choice. It's time to decide whether we'll be followers of God or just one of his fans. It starts with me and it starts with you. It's time for us to stand up before a watching world and declare with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we, we just thank you again for these corrections, these, but these great truths as well. We thank you that you are forever faithful and forgive us when sometimes we drift. Forgive us when we're sometimes pulled away by other things which take our attention, our time. But Lord, we thank you that there's always a way back, that you're a God of great grace, and abundant grace and mercy. And Lord, we thank you that your word speaks to us clearly. And so, Lord, challenge us by your word and spirit today, we pray, to the glory of Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Although we can't shake hands and all we can still share the peace with one another. Let's look around and share the peace and then we'll come around the Lord's table together. <laughs> it's all a bit strange, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is worthy to be praised. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you gave your one and only Son to die on the cross for our redemption. By his death, he has offered the one perfect sacrifice, all that was needed to take away the sins of the world and reconcile you, his Father, to us. By his rising to life, he has restored us to life eternal. He has given us your promised Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance. Therefore, with your whole creation and with all your people since time began, we honor and glorify you with words of never-ending praise, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And we continue together. We dare not come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your grace alone. 
We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. Gracious Father, grant that we who receive these gifts of bread and wine according to our Saviour's word, where he eat his body and drink his blood, that we may always live in him and he in us. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Almighty God, we thank you for this bread and for all you provide to sustain us. Above all, merciful Father, we thank you for Christ, your Son, given for the life of the world. Amen. This bread we break is a participation in the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for making us one with Christ and making us yours forever. We have shared at the table of the Lord, say it together, thank you, Heavenly Father, for the assurance that we shall eat and drink with Christ when he comes in the glory of his kingdom. Amen. Well, let me close with this prayer of blessing. Remember, Father, you are church bought by the blood of your Son, and gather it in all in us into the kingdom you have prepared for it direct us by your spirit in all our ways stir us to live lives to your glory make us faithful witnesses to jesus and his resurrection eager for the joy of his coming and made worthy to worship you with all your saints forever amen and all god's people say come lord jesus amen amen thank you